Society today is composed of a series of institutions. From political institutions, legal institutions, religious institutions, to institutions of social class, familial values, and occupational specialization, it is obvious the profound influence these traditionalized structures have in shaping our understandings and perspectives. Yet, of all the social institutions we are born into, directed by, and conditioned upon, there seems to be no system as taken for granted and misunderstood as the monetary system. Taking on nearly religious proportions, the established monetary institution exists as one of the most unquestioned forms of faith there is. How money is created, the policies by which it is governed, and how it truly affects society are unregistered interests of the great majority of the population. In a world where 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth, in a world where 34,000 children die every single day from poverty and preventable diseases, and where 50% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day, one thing is clear, something is very wrong. And whether we are aware of it or not, the lifeblood of all of our established institutions, and thus society itself, is money. Therefore, understanding this institution of monetary policy is critical to understanding why our lives are the way they are. Unfortunately, economics is often viewed with confusion and boredom. Endless streams of financial jargon coupled with intimidating mathematics quickly deters people from attempts at understanding it. However, the fact is, the complexity associated with the financial system is a mere mask designed to conceal one of the most socially paralyzing structures humanity has ever endured. A number of years ago, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, produced a document entitled Modern Money Mechanics. This publication detailed the institutionalized practice of money creation as utilized by the Federal Reserve and the web of global commercial banks it supports. On the opening page, the document states its objective. The purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. It then proceeds to describe this fractional reserve process through various banking terminology. A translation of which goes something like this. The United States government decides it needs some money, so it calls up the Federal Reserve and requests, say, $10 billion. The Fed replies, saying, sure, we'll buy $10 billion in government bonds from you. So the government takes some pieces of paper, paints some official looking designs on them, and calls them treasury bonds. Then it puts a value on these bonds to the sum of $10 billion and sends them over to the Fed. In turn, the people at the Fed draw up a bunch of impressive pieces of paper themselves, only this time calling them Federal Reserve Notes, also designating a value of $10 billion to the set. The Fed then takes these notes and trades them for the bonds. Once this exchange is complete, the government then takes the $10 billion in Federal Reserve Notes and deposits it into a bank account. And, upon this deposit, the paper notes officially become legal tender money, adding $10 billion to the U.S. money supply. And there it is. $10 billion in new money has been created. Of course, this example is a generalization, for, in reality, this transaction would occur electronically, with no paper used at all. In fact, only 3% of the U.S. money supply exists in physical currency. The other 97% essentially exists in computers alone. Now, government bonds are, by design, instruments of debt. And when the Fed purchases these bonds, with money it essentially created out of thin air, the government is actually promising to pay back that money to the Fed. In other words, the money was created out of debt. This mind-numbing paradox of how money or value can be created out of debt or a liability will become more clear 
as we further this exercise. So the exchange has been made and now $10 billion sits in a commercial bank account. Here is where it gets really interesting. For as based on the fractional reserve practice, that $10 billion deposit instantly becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And regarding reserve requirements, as stated in modern money mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a $10 billion deposit, 10% or 1 billion is held as the required reserve while the other 9 billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now, it is logical to assume that this 9 billion is literally coming out of the existing 10 billion dollar deposit. However, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the 9 billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing 10 billion dollar deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in Modern Money Mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the 9 billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a 10 billion dollar deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available 9 billion dollars. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated and in turn 90% of the 9 billion or 8.1 billion is now available as newly created money for more loans. And of course that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency. They don't say debase the currency, they don't say devalue the currency, they don't say cheat the people who are saved, they say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the US dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation, 
since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought, for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates.